Good brothers and sisters. Today I want to talk about 1 Corinthians 14 and it's verse 29 to start with. And well-known verse, of course, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Let two or three prophets speak. Now, what's the context of this uh, scripture? Of course, it's Corinthians, it's Paul writing to a troubled church. They have different troubles. They have, uh, seems like chaos going on in their church, where everybody has a tongue, everybody has a psalm, everybody has a word. Paul's trying to bring order to it. They have schisms within it. Some are for Paul, others for Apollos. So Paul has a troubled church here and he's writing to them and, and this, is, this is the instructions, this is the express instructions from Paul the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Church of the Corinthians and not just to the Church of the Corinthians he is laying down a basic framework for how they should be doing their gatherings and we can take obviously from that how we should be doing, taking our gatherings as well let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge do two or, two or three prophets speak in your church? if not, why not? I love the simplicity of the gospel. <laughs> We've covered it in layers and layers and layers of tradition. Centuries of uh, denominational doctrine. Some, of course, have ripped the very heart of the scriptures uh, by denying the, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, the sign gifts of the Spirit. But anyway, it says, let two or three prophets speak and let the other judge. And then in verse 30 it says, but, so wait a minute, there's a but. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Wow, that's, that's. That's just profound, isn't it? So a prophet speaking, potentially two or three that morning, that afternoon, that evening, whenever it is they were gathering. There's a prophet speaking. And it says in verse 30, But if anyone, anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. So let's say I'm a prophet in a church and I'm speaking. I'm speaking by the unction of the Holy Spirit. He's moving through me. And a little uh, hand goes up in the corner. And you say, yes, brother, yes, sister. And they would say they had something to add. Let the first keep silent. Let them add what they have to add. It's a marvellous thing. It's a humble thing, isn't it? Imagine the average Sunday morning service where the preacher's in full... <laughs> he's in the middle of his sermon he's speaking and a hand goes up and somebody says I have another angle on what you're saying here I've got another the Lord has given me a, a word that would add to what you're saying here wouldn't fly nine churches out of ten just wouldn't fly would it you know people say well it's chaos and disorder I'm just reading out what the scripture says let two or three prophets speak. And if another one sits by, but if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. Hmm. Up in 24, back in verse 24 in the same chapter of 14, it says, But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Unbeliever or the uninformed. Huh. We could talk a lot about who the uninformed is. Certainly it was people who were not aware of the gifting of the Holy Spirit, of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Certainly people say, not even, didn't even know there was such a thing. 
uninformed. An unbeliever. By the work of the Holy Spirit working through two or three or more, he's telling a story that day. The Holy Spirit is is relaying a message. And he wants to use the body. He wants to use the gathering. Because it says here that but of all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He is convicted by all. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in the all. This is what we're dealing with here. The work of the Holy Spirit in the in all. Is that the kind of ministry you have in your church? There's something marvellous, something humble about the fact that you can have a word from the Lord and stand up again to give that word, but you're stopped. Because somebody else puts a hand up and says they, they have something to add. You don't get a chance to finish your thought, but guess what? The person who stands up, he's got something to add. And remember, this has been orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. He adds to what you were saying, and somebody else adds to that too. But of all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. And he is convicted by all. In verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and be encouraged. You see a theme there? You see that word all? That all may be used by God. That the unbeliever or the uninformed, is convinced and convicted by all. Marvellous, isn't that the work of the Holy Spirit? Now think about the gathering, perhaps as you would think about a symphony. Uh, the symphony is the whole. The orchestra plays the symphony. We are the orchestra. Symphony is the music. Holy Spirit is the conductor. God is the composer. Composer, conductor, orchestra, symphony. Symphony is the word. Orchestra is the people. Holy Spirit is the conductor. God is the author of all. This is a picture of what we're seeing and what Paul is, I believe that what Paul is trying to convey to the Corinthians of the work of the Holy Spirit amongst the body of Christ. This is what's desperately missing, I believe. Across the world, Christendom, what we call Christendom. This particular work right here, the all, the two or the three, the one that's sitting by, the one that gets a word. It's marvellous, isn't it, the way that the Lord... The only difference, I would say, is that a symphony is something that's pre-written. So it's not something that we can bring to the table, so to speak. It's not that God can't speak a word to you. Let's say he speaks a word to you during the week. You come together in the, the gathering and you begin to share that word. That's fine. There's many instruments in an orchestra. Sometimes there's solo parts in a symphony. And they're marvellous, aren't they? Like a violin solo in the midst of the symphony. And uh, but who's writing this music? It's God Himself that's writing the music. So I suppose the question becomes in the end, do you want to be part of an orchestra? Or do you want to sit and listen to a one man band? We've seen one man bands, <laughs> they're kind of cool actually, you know. It takes a lot of skill to be a one man band. He's got his drums and maybe his banjo and, and, and a mouth organ and symbols attached to somewhere, there's levers getting pulled, all these different things, but it's the one man. <laughs> Nobody would ever compare a one man band to a beautiful orchestra playing marvellous symphonies. One's goofy, 
kind of funny, entertaining. Maybe we'll throw uh, pennies in his hat. He's got a hat there collecting money for what he was doing. And then you've got a magnificent orchestra, finely tuned, conducted by the Holy Spirit himself. He knows every single instrument the, that's playing in the orchestra. He knows exactly when one's to come in, when one's to keep silent, when they're all to play together. And the, and the symphony itself, the music itself, is written by God himself. I would propose to you that this picture of the symphony, this, this what we're seeing here in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, what Paul is conveying to the Corinthians is something magnificent. You see that the orchestra simply can't play itself. The orchestra needs the conductor. That's why you can't have everybody just jumping up and saying whatever you want to say. Can't have it. It's chaos, madness. It would be like if the unbeliever or the unconvinced comes in and everybody's speaking in tongues at one time. Madness. If you're part of a prayer group where everybody's praying in tongues at one time, there's no interpretation. Madness. And this is exactly what the scripture tells us here in First Corinthians 14. The unbeliever, the unconvinced, think you're mad as a hatter. They walk in and something like that. But if they walk in and they hear a prophet prophesying, they hear prophets prophesying, they hear men and women speaking as led by the Holy Spirit, as being conducted by the Holy Spirit, words from God himself to the hearts of men. They'll fall down, it says, and thus the secrets of the heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. When's the last time you had an unconvinced or an unbeliever fall down on their face? Crying out that surely God is among you because the secrets of his heart has been revealed. This is being revealed in an orchestra set up. The setting is an orchestra. There's multiple instruments being played here. But not in disorder. Perfectly ordered. Perfectly ordered by the Holy Spirit of the living God. But the problem is for a lot of people out there, you don't believe that, do you? You don't believe that the Holy Spirit can order such a meeting. You don't really believe in the premise of 1 Corinthians 14. It sounds wonderful, but you don't really believe in it. If you read the reports, the news reports from the Welsh Revival, sometimes there was 1,000, 1,500 people in one building. Some of these secular reporters, what? One of the things that amazed them most was how could there be order? How could there be order amongst these people when there's nobody in charge? They marveled at that. They marveled at that. A thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand people all crammed into a building, all stand at the back door. One prays, one sings a song, one gives a word, another adds to that word. It's exactly what we just read in First Corinthians 14. That's the simplicity of it, brothers and sisters. We're desperately missing that kind of work. One-man band, magnificent orchestra. I know what I would choose to be a part of. I would rather be part of an orchestra than be a spectator of a one-man band. I really would. God bless you.